Good morning. I'm Sam Abul Samad, Principal Analyst for eMobility Ecosystems Research with Guidehouse Insights. We're the, uh, the market research arm of Guidehouse Consulting's Energy Sustainability and Infrastructure Group. And I'd like to welcome you to our first panel today, uh, the autonomous vehicle, when, where, how, and for whom. Uh, we've got a great uh, panel uh, discussion coming up. But first, I just want to share a few, few thoughts with you here. All right. <clears throat> so, as I said, uh, uh, we've got a great panel coming up, and I just want to share a few things uh, before we get into the discussion. So uh, let's take a little trip back in time, back to about 2015. And of course, as we all know now, you know, 2018 will, of course, be the year of the autonomous car because you know everybody was predicting it back in 2014, 2015. You know, it was it was bound to come true because you know predictions, especially from Silicon Valley, um, always uh, come to pass. Uh, or Will that be 2019 or maybe 2020? You know, back in, in around 2016, Travis Kalanick, the former CEO of Uber, was calling automated vehicles an, an existential threat to Uber's business model because he felt that if, uh, if his competitors were able to somehow get uh, automated vehicles working, get robo-taxis and, and automated ride-hailing work, working and get human drivers out of the loop, which were the biggest cost factor for Uber, uh, then his business would be destroyed. And you know, so subsequently Uber and their competitors Lyft and Didi and China and various others all dove into uh, spending many, many millions, actually billions of dollars on development of automated vehicles. Venture capitalists in Silicon Valley and elsewhere around the world were piling billions of dollars into investments um, with anybody that said that they could come up with an automated driving system. Um, as we now know, most of those have not plan panned out very well. Um, we're still not quite in the age of automated vehicles. They haven't taken over. Uh, Tony Seba's prediction from his Rethink X report a few years ago that by, by the end of this decade, 95% uh, of all trips would be in automated vehicles probably not going to happen but you know where are we um you know it turns out that uh even you know a, a, a self-acknowledged genius like elon musk um has come to the realization that developing automated driving systems is actually a really hard problem you know he this tweet from july you know, he acknowledged it's 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 difficult uh and it's uh that said nothing has more degrees of freedom than reality as as we all know and and that is actually one of the key problems uh for automated driving systems is being able to get a machine get software to understand and perceive the world around us and get get that semantic understanding of the world around us in the way that human drivers do for all of our flaws as human beings um we're actually really good at at some things, including it turns out we're not so bad at driving, even though we do make a lot of mistakes. Um, you know, we humans are one of the key causes of 90 plus percent of all the crashes in the world. But it turns out that despite that, we're we're we actually don't make that many mistakes that lead to crashes when you consider it in the grand scheme of how much driving we actually do prior to last year prior to 2020 we were driving an average of about 3.2 trillion miles a year in the united states about six and a half million crashes which works out to about one crash every half a million miles for the average driver that drives about 12 to 15,000 miles a year, your probability of being in a crash is about once every 30 years. And in fact, for most people, uh, it's far less than that. So um, it's a this is a, a difficult task to do that humans are actually surprisingly good at, all things considered. You know, we're able to deal with things like weather and light lighting conditions and a lot of other factors that machines are still struggling with but we are making progress nonetheless it's the progress is slow um, from our uh, forecast at guidehouse uh, we're projecting that by 2030 we will have somewhere around 13 million level four vehicles deployed globally um, by mid-decade it's probably going to be somewhere around 300,000 or less and most of those vehicles are going to be for service type applications, both cargo initially, cargo is gonna be a big one, especially early on, and then robo taxis as well. 
most most of the the true level four AVs are not going to be consumer vehicles that you can go out and buy. Uh, at least we don't think so at, at Guidehouse. Um, be the the cost and complexity of this technology and the fact that it's going to be uh, remain uh, to fairly restricted operating domains for the foreseeable future uh, is going to make it less appealing for consumers to spend the money uh, to get self-driving, you know, beyond people like the early adopters that are willing to spend $10,000 for vaporware on a Tesla. Uh, but uh, for for these commercial applications, whether it be carrying people or carrying goods, um, there is a real potential business here. And especially in China, we, we think about half the market uh, globally is going to be in China, which is bigger than China's share of the global vehicle market. Uh, but as we make our way towards that level four future, um, a lot of the technology that's being developed for uh, level four automation, despite the fact that it's not quite ready to go fully automated like that, uh, is being seen as beneficial for uh, driver assist systems. And so what we're seeing now is a lot of the lessons that have been learned, a lot of the technology that's being developed, whether it's sensing technology, software, or compute, is being pulled back uh, into uh, these level one, level two, level three systems that are more assistive systems as opposed to full automation. And uh, that can help improve safety uh, and uh, make driving more convenient for consumers. And so, you know, uh, the total market share of these various technologies over the coming decade is going to be predominantly, uh, in terms of the number of in total number of vehicles, is going to be predominantly in that level two and and even some level three as we get further into the decade uh, systems. In fact, the first level real level three systems are already on the road now. Um, Honda launched uh, a version of the Legend sedan in uh, Japan earlier this year. Mercedes-Benz is about to launch um, a level three system on the S-Class and the EQS uh, by the end of this year in Germany. And we're going to see more and more of these. We're certainly seeing a lot more level two systems, both hands-on and increasingly hands-free systems that are taking advantage of the compute technology that's been developed by companies like NVIDIA and, and competitors like Mobileye and others, um, as well as the sensing technology. We're seeing LiDAR coming into these vehicles today, even though they're not not anywhere near level four yet. Um, again, Mercedes has got LiDAR on, on the EQS and the S-Class. Uh, 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 Honda is using LiDAR on the Legend. Uh, a variety of other vehicles are getting LiDAR. Um, recently, Volvo announced that the replacement for the current XC90, their, their three-row crossover that is gonna launch next year, is gonna come standard with Luminar LiDAR on it. And it won't be level four capable at launch. Uh, it'll they'll have a, a hands-free uh, level two plus type of system on it. But eventually, uh, over time, as they they gain confidence in the system and they prove out the safety of the system, they do plan to upgrade the software to bring it up and and add capabilities like level four uh, highway automation. But er, Initially, what they want to start with is using it, using things like LIDAR and, and uh, upgraded radar systems to provide more proactive safety for the vehicles that are on the road today. So I think that's that's still a real benefit, even though we're not getting full automation yet, uh, widespread, uh, that we are gaining benefits from this development effort. Uh, so automation is is coming. Uh, it's taking time. We've got it on the roads today. Uh, there's a lot of testing going on globally. It's going to move goods and people um, in a wide variety of different kinds of applications. We've got Waymo Robo Taxis running around San Francisco now. They just started carrying passengers. Motional has been carrying passengers since 2018, uh, paying passengers on the Lyft platform in Las Vegas. Uh, we've also got companies like May Mobility that are operating these lower speed shuttles and transitioning to uh, to uh, more on-demand ride-hailing services. Uh, you've got long-haul trucking from companies like Too Simple and Embark and Waymo and Daimler. Uh, you've got delivery vehicles from companies like Neuro um, uh, with lo slightly larger delivery vehicles, automated delivery vehicles that 
don't carry pass aren't designed to carry passengers at all. And then of course, you know, smaller sidewalk bots like the the Yandex Rover. Um, and you know, you've got companies, uh, big OEMs partnering with companies like Argo uh, to bring um, uh, robo taxis and delivery uh, automated delivery vehicles to roads. We just saw yesterday, or, or maybe it was the day before, Volkswagen and Argo announcing uh, the ID Buzz AD using Argo's uh, technology. As I mentioned, uh, Motional uh, just the other day or last week revealed uh, their upcoming robo taxi um, that they are now testing um, based on the Hyundai Ionic Five. Uh, that's in my, you can see it behind me uh, on the screen. Uh, and that's going to be the platform for their upcoming multi city uh, robo taxi service. And then the, the next step beyond, you know, looking at where do we, where can we deploy this, of course, is regulations. Uh, one of the first regulations governing some of this kind of technology uh, is now being rolled out last year. The UNECE adopted the first uh, regulations for level three automation. Uh, what they call lane keeping, uh, lane keeping assist systems or automated lane keeping systems, uh, where these are, you know, systems that can do speed and directional control, uh, that don't require the human to be constantly supervising it the way you do with current level 2 systems like GM super cruise or Tesla autopilot. These are systems that allow the driver to do something else, at least temporarily within the operating when it's when the vehicles within its operating domain. Right now, it's extremely restrictive. Uh, first countries to um, actually uh, adopt the regulations uh, were Japan and Germany, uh, and I think the UK is, I think, currently in process of doing that. There's 60 member countries that are part of the UNEC harmonized regulation system. Um, and what we're going to see over the coming years is more and more of this um, as as the as it gets um, as the the technology starts to mature. Regulators are going to have to keep up. We're even here in the U.S. finally starting to see uh, NHTSA doing something with this, uh, bring, uh, starting to starting to get really gather data uh, about the effectiveness of these systems that, with their order in early July. Uh, that any OEMs or automated driving system developers developing anything that's level two or above have to submit. Uh, reports on any crashes that occur, which I think is is a really good first step uh, towards uh, getting this and proving the efficacy of this. We've also got efforts like the IEEE, I think it's 2946 uh, effort, which is um, de defining some rules around what is good enough, you know, where or what you know what are the the criteria for evaluating these systems, uh, and that's based on Mobilize uh, RSS. Uh, responsibility sensitive safety model uh, system. So we're we're making a lot of progress. It's it's still slow going, but we're starting to see real efforts. You know, re real growth in this, uh, especially in 2022. I think we're going to see a lot more expansion of these pilot programs, uh, and 2023 and beyond. Uh, companies like Motional and, and others uh, really starting to pick up steam uh, as we bring this to market. So with that. I'd like to start introducing my panel. Uh, first up, uh, I mentioned Motional. Uh, Gretchen Efgen is the Vice President of Go to Market for uh, Motional. Gretchen, good morning. How are you today? Good morning. I'm well. Thank you. What a great um, overview of where the industry is. I was smiling and, and nodding along. Lots of salient insights on um, and refreshing on you know where where the industry is and the uh, trajectory that we're on. So thanks for that. Great overview. And thank you, Gretchen. And um, I'd also like to introduce Dean Harris, the uh, head of industry business development for autonomous vehicles at NVIDIA. Dean, good morning. Hi, Sam. Good morning. Welcome to be here. Thanks for having me. And finally, Jeff Mills, the chief revenue officer of iMerit. Great to be here. Thanks, uh, Sam. An awesome, awesome uh, intro. Loved it. Um, thank you very much. So let's let's dive into the conversation here. So I'd like to hear from from each of the three of you um, what you think. Um, you know, wh where do you see the timeline 
uh, for mass deployment for fully autonomous vehicles. By fully autonomous, I'm talking about level four vehicles, which don't require any human supervision or interaction um, uh, or, or, or uh, takeover. Um, so this would be level four, you know, they can be restricted to uh, a specific ODD, op operational design domain, but, you know, don't require human supervision. When, uh, let's start with you, Jeff. Uh, where, where, do you, where do you think is the timeline? No, I, I thought your I thought actually what you what you put together in, in your presentation seemed uh, pretty reasonable to me. I, I think the the nuance. Um, what was the quote? Uh, more degrees of freedom than reality. I, I think uh, you, you you brought up earlier. I think that nuance, um, those edge cases that that pop up, uh, and what we kind of call the beginning of the last mile delivery is 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 very is very cumbersome. Uh, so you mentioned Las Vegas. Uh, I think Motional uh, is is working there. Um, I think these areas where you can start to bring down some of the edge cases a bit um, and some of that nuance uh, will launch first, right? So I I think you know if you think about Las Vegas, uh, being able to go from the strip to the airport, um, you know around the strip, you know you can start to cut down some of those um, kind of nuances, and and so I think in those areas. Things will things will launch you know sooner than later. Um, I think in full consumerized, like I'm going to be able to buy that car and it's going to take me everywhere I want to go, anywhere I want to go. Yeah, that's that's a different that's a different jump. So you know at iMerit we work with three of the top five largest AV companies um, in the world, as well as some of the delivery companies you mentioned. Um, we also do uh, smart agriculture, smart mining. When you start getting into agriculture and mining in these different areas, those variables start to come down. So you're going to get there much, much faster in, in those spaces. Uh, but when you're talking about consumers riding in a car that takes them anywhere that they want to go, yeah, I, I think you're looking at probably 10 years out before that's going to be mass, you know, kind of mass deployed. Dean, your thoughts? Yeah, thanks, Sam. As you mentioned, I mean, there are many uh, test pilots happening today on the roads. I mean, Waymo and Phoenix, uh, San Francisco, Auto X, and Shen, you mentioned Motional. Uh, you know, these things are happening as we speak. I mean, um, for personal intelligent transportation, you know, software defined vehicles are also starting to enter the market. I mean, as you know, Mercedes Benz is beginning to roll out their uh, next gen uh, fleet powered by NVIDIA Drive Warren in, in 2024, which is just around the corner. So, you know, we're starting to see these rollouts happen uh, in, in the coming years. Um, you know, it will continue to happen in phases. Um, you know, again, there's dozens of, of pilot tests happening around the world. I mean, this fairly restricted access will continue in, in, in specialized vehicles that work in these controlled environments like ports and mines, you know, with robo taxis, slow, low speed passenger shuttles um, and, and, and ride hailing services, you know, all operating in these relatively small geofenced areas and even uh, in sidewalk delivery robots are happening. You know, we're seeing Long haul trucking pilots hitting the highways like too simple. Um, another one is Volvo trucks. They're conducting hub to hub pilots in these semi confined like uh, like harbors. So you know the key to uh, to continuing this progress is is you know moving towards safer, more efficient uh, autonomous transportation. And and how you get there is is with you know centralized compute. You know it's really what's enabling the vehicles to uh, to get there. So that has to build up over time as they become more and more intelligent in, in these phases. You know, it, uh, it comes down to safety and human lives. Obviously, we want to make sure we're not only getting it right, but that you're never never getting it wrong. Yeah, Gretchen, how about how about uh, you? What's what's your perspective from Motional? Uh, so I appreciate the um, the question around mass deployment because I think it's the word mass that uh, that actually makes this one a trickier uh, question to answer, right? Because you have to start actually con constraining, like, well, what do you mean by mass? You know, you can imagine working uh, for emotional get asked all the time. So when when will I get to ride in an autonomous car? You know, the answer has to be well. If you're in Las Vegas, you can demo our, our driver monitored, you know, technology now. But you can start to experience that. And there are, you know, Sam, to your point around, okay, this is this is ODD constrained. Um, I think there is a difference between what what we as a as a consumer and, and folks that that aren't in the industry. When you think mass adoption, you know, I think okay, a car as a human can drive it today, which is you know, pretty much anywhere and in mostly all conditions, right? There's certainly weather conditions that 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 humans don't attempt to operate in either because they're not safe. Um, so I think with with autonomous 
vehicles and applications like Dean and Jeff just alluded to, when you talk about uh, uh, deployments, you have to think about them in geographies, in defined areas, and we will have applications, uh, you know, within the next you know, three, five, seven years that are for defined use cases and defined, you know, routes and, and geofences. Um, and does that qualify as mass deployment? Well, I suppose within that geography, um, it could, but is that mass, you know, globally? Um, you know, I think it's, uh, it'll be one step at a time and eventually that will all stitch together uh, down the line for mass. What I, th I think we think about as a consumer is mass deployment. Great, thanks. So um, I'll stay with you for a second, um, Gretchen. Uh, what what are the main challenges to getting to that mass deployment, and, and how do we overcome those? What's 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 going? You know, what do we have to do to get there? Well, safety is first and foremost, right? There are very very few companies that have uh, you know been authorized to remove the, the the human monitor from from the vehicle, right? And that's a really high bar, and it should be. These are safety critical technologies, uh, which, as you acknowledged in your opening, you know, even with you know with human drivers, we unfortunately still are you know the cause of many crashes. These are it's really complex, right? To solve driving, you know, on the road where there's uh, you know, obstructed pedestrians and edge cases that, you know, the human brain is is very good at solving for, but not infallible. Uh, and so to teach, you know, our AI systems to do that um, and to anticipate any possible, you know, type of edge cases just is a long tail uh, type of problem. Uh, back to you, Dean. Uh, I know, you know, one of the big things that NVIDIA is involved in is simulation uh, because that's that's a key thing to try to uh, tackle those edge cases. How you know what 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 do you see as the the main those main challenges for getting to that mass deployment? How do we prove the safety of these systems? Oh, you're muted, Dean. Thanks, Sam. Um, you know, back to what Gretchen was saying too. Our, our number one priority in video is safety. Also, right, the industry must have this focus to in order to build that public trust. So, you know, developing the AI hardware and software systems, you know, so training, testing, and, and validating, as you mentioned, um, IVs in the data center, we're developing solutions that enable the industry and regulators to establish those safety standards for, for AV systems, right? You mentioned simulation. I mean, uh, we realized that, you know, this is a critical element to. Oh. Dean, your audio has dropped out. No. Uh, maybe you can uh, maybe you can unplug your mic and plug it back in, and I'll I'll go to Jeff for a minute. And we'll come back to you on on that and continue that. Uh, Jeff, um, what from from iMerit's perspective? I mean, you know, one of the, the you know you're you're involved in a little bit different aspect of this development. What you know what do you see as the the big challenges to getting to mass deployment? Yeah, it's it's data, data, data. So you know, we we we're hearing uh, about edge cases already. We're talking about the nuances of that. Uh, it's just the amount of data that needs to be annotated and trained within these models to to bring that safety level up. Uh, you can't be at ninety five percent quality when it comes to you know a self driving car. You have to be at like one hundred and five percent quality, right? So um, you know, when, again, when we get into these kind of more contained areas, uh, the edge cases and, and um, nuances start to drop. Um, but when you start talking about mass deployment, you, you have to have tons of data. And when we're working on data, obviously, within um, within data annotation of images and, and video, um, you know, LIDARs become really big, even radar is getting big. And then now it's really a lot of mapping. Um, so, you know, there's a ton of mapping that has to be overlaid on top of these uh, systems as well. When you start talking about public works and um, you know, event spaces, how all of a sudden, you know, roads go from one way, one direction to one way, the other direction, you know, at different times, uh, because an event got out. Right. So there's all this different type of, uh, data that needs to be annotated. I think that, um, the sharing of that data over time is going to be continuously a, a question that people are going to keep asking themselves. Would it, we get there faster if, if all of the top 80 companies share their data? Um, but it's also the proprietary data that, that makes each one of them you know, super uh, valuable. So, you know, that's going to be a really interesting uh, thing to watch. Um, one of the things that's come up a couple of times is, is about um, how humans, you know, are able to make these judgment calls. I, I heard you say it, and I think Gretchen's made kind of a, a topic about that too, a second ago. 
one of the things that we do that that the AVs can't do is decide which information we want to take in. I think that's one of the nuances people kind of forget about from the human mind is, is there's data points that are happening all the time. And we actually turn off a whole bunch of these data points, you know, every day, all the time, and just decide not to consume those data points at, at any given time. But an AV doesn't do that. It takes in all of the data all of the time and is making decisions on all of the data. And so that data needs to be at the highest level. And so, um, you know, what we're seeing right now is that the use cases that we're working on, the types of data we're working with just continues to get more nuanced, more sophisticated. And in the data labeling kind of world, it's been talked about humans in the loop for a long time. It's really experts in the loop now. Like, like it's not just humans. Like you have to be at the highest, highest level of understanding the nuance, the use case for each one of the different um, annotation jobs you're doing for, for any specific uh, AV client. Yeah, you make an interesting point there about the, the human's ability to turn off certain kinds of data. I mean, one of the, the interesting things, if you uh, do some research on uh, adversarial AI attacks, as, as an example, uh, mm -hmm. you can find studies that have been done where you take an, an image, a digital image, and you add just a little bit of noise to it, and it, it totally messes, it can totally mess up uh, an image recognition AI, uh, and it totally mischaracterizes what it is, whereas a human can look at it and, and Turn, essentially turn off that data and say, yeah, that's that's still a dog, even though you've added some digital noise to that image. You know, uh, so it's 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 pretty remarkable what the human brain can do. Um, Dean, let me go back to you. Go ahead. We're able, to, we're able to shut off the kids' voices in our minds sometimes mm -hmm. in the back of the car, right? The the AI can't shut off yeah. the kids' voices in the back of the car. Yeah, right? it keeps great hearing, example. It keeps hearing them yelling all the time. <laughs> Yeah, Dean, uh, let's go back to you uh, to uh, finish your, your response to the, the big challenges. And you're, I think you're getting into simulation a little bit. Sure, yeah, can you be okay? Yep, loud and clear. Uh, yeah, so the industry, as I was mentioned, realized that simulation, um, you know, is a, is a critical element to mass deployment of safe AVs. It's, you know, it's impossible to cover every situation a self-driving car may encounter or repeat these scenarios under a wide range of conditions, you know, all to ensure that the AV can can properly handle them, right? So all these different corner cases that you're talking about, they need to be emulated. I mean, there's no way you could create them in the real world. Uh, simulation platforms like NVIDIA Drive, uh, Constellation and Drive Sim software, you know, provide this test of uh, self-driving technology. You know, you can uh, do different scenarios with different possible weather uh, scenarios, traffic conditions, locations, you know, as well as those rare and dangerous uh, scenarios. So these tests are repeatable and then scalable. Uh, you know, you can enabling a comprehensive validation strategy before these cars reach the road. So again, helping build that trust and insurance that you're doing all the testing that you can do before you deploy these vehicles on the road. Okay, um, Gretchen, what what do you where do you see is the the primary geographic regions where this technology is going to get adopted first, and and who are likely to be the those early adopters in those regions? Right. So, you know, I think it's widely known that some of the, the challenges, certainly for the early technology, are related to, you know, weather and, and climate types of conditions. So, you know, we certainly expect that, you know, warmer climates, uh, you know, and, and those perhaps without a ton of rain, rain is something we have a lot of experience with in our in our Singapore location, for sure. Uh, you know, with, with with good modern infrastructure, well-marked uh, lanes, these are the types of places uh, where you'll see deployments are the earliest as far as who is adopting you know we've we've hosted well over we, we've had over a hundred thousand rides in our through our partnership with lyft and through that a couple hundred thousand passengers have come through in uh in our vehicles now surely they're they're self-selecting they're opting into you know checking out uh an autonomous car but what we see universally is uh you know whether folks are really excited and on the edge of their seat to check it out you know or even a little angsty and nervous within the first two minutes, they see how safe the car drives. They see the visualization that the car knows where it's going, that it sees the pedestrian in the crosswalk, that it recognizes that there's a tree, you know, off to the side of, of the road. It brings a tremendous amount of comfort to people very quickly. So we see inside the first two minutes, uh, a level of comfort uh, that comes over uh, the passenger. And we know this because they start ignoring the ride and they get on their phone. 
they go back to doing exactly what they would be doing in any typical uh, ride hail kind of situation, which is, you know, going back to checking email, checking social media, et cetera. And you do that if you feel comfortable, you know, with, with the driving style uh, of the vehicle. And, you know, so we, we have seen an incredible enthusiasm for, you know, testing the technology and then riding again, you know, repeat rep passenger rates are, are really high and also tremendous amount of interest uh, and enthusiasm for folks who are mobility impaired, you know, for any number of reasons and also for parents, you know, trying to figure out carpools and, and getting kids around and, you know, curious for, for what are going to be options in the future for safe transportation options. Yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting. You, met, it's good you mentioned, uh, you know, people that are mobility impaired. You know, there's a, a lot of people who, uh, for various reasons, are unable to drive, uh, you know, but would like to have that mobility. Uh, there was actually, I just saw this morning, a uh, report came out uh, from Arizona um, of people in, in the, the Chandler area that were using another service. Um, and the the people that were uh, you know had some sort of physical impairment um, or were older and didn't want to drive were actually the the ones that were most enthusiastic about utilizing that service. So I think that that's that's actually a really important uh, use case for this technology as we go forward. Um, Jeff, uh, you know, as as a company that is handling a lot of this data. Um, I'm, I'm curious, you know, what you think about, you know, you, you, I'm sure you see a lot of data from different geographic areas, you know, from your various uh, customers that you're working with. Uh, you know, what, what do you, do you have any thoughts on, you know, what kind of regions you know, or what are the, what are some of the, the things that are coming up, you know, from the, the data that you see that, you know, might be a particular challenge for this? Yeah, um, for, first, just to, you, what you called mobility earlier, some people call freedom. And so, mm -hmm. you know, uh, being able to access uh, vehicles um, to be able to, to get somewhere from point A to point B isn't, isn't just mobility, it's freedom, right? And, and that's why a lot of people are really, um, you know, embracing and, and, and waiting for this to happen. Because uh, if, you, if you talk to anybody who's getting older, uh, it's not about their fear of getting hurt or breaking a hip. It's their fear of, of losing their freedom. And, and, and that's something that I think we have to keep remembering that in, in the industry we're working on, um, it's, it's about giving people options and, and the ability to, to stay, you know, free longer. Um, as far as is which ge uh, geographies, you know, there's something like 21 states now, I think, doing, doing early testing. Um, if you get into the early adopters within those, you know, Northern California obviously has a lot of sites. Las Vegas specifically as a, as a city has a lot of sites, Washington DC, uh, I think Detroit's you know, clearly another one that has, that has a lot of sites. And so anywhere that you see significant testing going on is clearly gonna be where the first early adopters are gonna, are gonna be able to run. Um, you know, so I, again, Northern California, Detroit, Las Vegas, DC, I, I think are areas that you're gonna probably see some of this stuff from again, a consumer perspective happen, happen earlier. Mapping is a massive deal that I don't think everyone's gotten their mind fully around. Um, and so those areas being mapped early and often are going to be the areas that are going to be deployed the, you know, the um, most timely. Um, and so, you know, the, the areas I just mentioned um, clearly are being mapped as well. That's why the testing sites are there. Uh, and so, you know, those areas are, are going to um, probably adopt quicker. And then what you, people have to understand too is there's nuance within every single one of these cities, right? Um, if you think about, you know, even in states, there's kind of different rules of the road um, that, you know, kind of happen within each state and then within each city. And so, you know, if you're all of a sudden in DC, the traffic patterns are very different in DC than they are in Las Vegas. Um, the kinds of roads, the turnabouts, the um, decisions that you're making every day are a little bit different within these different these different areas. Even the way people cross streets in New York is different than the way that they cross streets in San Francisco. So, like, you know, these these types of things, you know, happen, um, and 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 the edge cases and the nuances of those edge cases become really really important um, to to be trained the way that um, that the companies want, you know, need to train those cars. And so, um, you know, hopefully that, that that helps a bit. But but I, I think those major cities that have the biggest testing sites that can be seen, you know, with a with a pretty quick search. Are the areas that are going to adopt the fastest um, because it does take that data and it does take that that training to be able to do it. Uh, Dean, you, Nvidia works with a lot of uh, automakers and AV companies around the world, from Sweden and Germany uh, to North America and China and, and elsewhere. Uh, you know, 
do you, are you seeing any geographic uh, differences um, that you know may point to where we're going to see this come out first? And and also you know maybe if you can follow up you know since Nvidia just recently uh, acquired uh, DeepMap uh, or DeepMap, yeah, um, you know on, talk a little bit about the the whole mapping challenge. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. As you mentioned, I mean uh, already. I mean you know we're seeing a lot of these deployments already in the U.S., uh, parts of Europe, Germany, and and Sweden. Um, China is also leading the charge in, in uh, you know, the early adoption of the of these vehicles. But every geographic region is what we're we're seeing is is unique, and this is the the, the key to to simulation. Um, you know, it is impossible for for every single geographic location and every single company to deploy these uh, vehicles on the road to collect the type of data that they need uh, to be able to run all the different environments and scenarios. So it's a it's a key part to to this deployment and this this phased approach. But again, um, you know, the early adopters, it, it comes back to these, these controlled environments right now, like, uh, like the ports and mines with robo taxis, uh, low speed uh, passenger shuttles, ride hailing service. We're seeing all of these in geofence areas right now, and they'll continue to build up over time as we see uh, these programs uh, building up and, and you know, they, they build up their validation strategy to be able to deploy more and more vehicles on, on, on the streets. Um, from the mapping side, I mean, deep map right now, I mean, uh, you know, that uh, the, the, uh, we have not announced the exact plans, what we're doing with deep map right now. I mean, we're obviously uh, building up our own uh, technology within NVIDIA uh, across the, the board. So uh, there'll be more to come on that as, as, as we see. And let me, um, let me stick with you for a second, Dean, um, with the, for the next question. Um, you know, again, you work as NVIDIA as a company works with, you know, the entire spectrum of companies in the AV space, from traditional OEMs to um, to a lot of these newcomers, and do you see you know are traditional automakers well positioned in this sector, or do you think that new entrants are going to dominate, or is it going to be a mix of both? You know, what how, how do you see that playing out? Sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, what we're seeing is you know the the ten trillion dollar transportation energy is quickly becoming a technology industry so uh, you know future cars are becoming now data center on wheels and and become can become completely programmable software defined uh, driven business models so you know companies are going to end up offering services and subscriptions over the air uh, for the life of these cars if you already see that happening right now across uh, some of the oems um, traditional auto OEMs are also starting to embrace this new business strategy, like like Mercedes, uh, Volvo, and, and even uh, Hyundai, for example. So, you know, we're also seeing new new energy vehicles or, or NEVs helping kickstart the, the the transition, right? With centralized software defined compute that that enables this continuous continuously improving cutting edge uh, AI capabilities that are needed, right? So we're we're leading with a number of, of um, uh, different EV brands who deliver these intelligent vehicles, um, you know, and bring them the mass marketing starting in, in 2022. Um, so, uh, yeah, these new new fleets will, you know, achieve the AI capabilities for, for greater safety and uh, and efficiency, you know, with this, uh, with this high performance compute that NVIDIA can can deliver, right, with, with our NVIDIA Drive platform. And we have a number of examples out there. I mean, NEO, our auto, IM, XPEN, Lee Auto, Canoe, Faraday, and, and a bunch of others. Gretchen, uh, Motional is a joint venture of Aptiv, uh, a longtime uh, tier one supplier, and, and Hyundai. But the company also has roots uh, in startups with Newtonomy and, and Automatica, uh, and, and, has, and Aptiv uh, has invested in a variety of startups. So what, what do you, what's your perspective on that question of, you know, traditional OEMs versus newcomers in this space? Yeah, so I think um, it's a question where uh, the, the industry perspective certainly evolved since I, I joined this space in late uh, 2016. You know, there was thinking at that time that, you know, the software developers were going to to dominate uh, within this space. And I think the appreciation that has grown over the last several years is really, one, not just how difficult it is to build uh, a vehicle and to manufacture uh, the 
just the, the form factor alone, but the safety critical nature of it to bring it back to that point of safety, you know, it's a highly regulated industry for a very good reason. And to actually be able to safely remove a driver requires the kind of integration between the software and the hardware that I, I truly feel is impossible to achieve without uh, the relationship with the between the automaker and the software developer being um, so concretely aligned. There needs to be mutual investment, and I don't I don't mean mutual investment is in. Um, I don't mean that in a lightweight way at all. You know, we've been through a number of partnerships where, you know, there's a joint North Star, this is what we're working to. But when it really gets into building your software into the guts of a vehicle and that OEM's brand being on that vehicle, that is a level of trust that is, uh, you know, you really have to be locking arms, integrating your systems at the deepest possible level. Um, and so, you know, I think it takes expertise in both. Uh, absolutely, um, but I, I think the the entities that are, are structured, you know, such that that trust, you know, can really be there between the OE and the software developer are going to have the best chances of success. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and Jeff, you know, your your perspective again as a company that's working with, uh, I don't know exactly which companies you're working with, but presumably uh, across the spectrum, you know, what do you see? Does is does, does either uh, either type of company have an advantage over the other or do, is it going to be a mix you know blending of expertise from these different areas yeah first of all i love what gretchen just said the, the there's the investment um decisions that are being made and then there's then there's the partnerships where you can see the trust that's, that's being formed those, those are two different things right there, there's there's companies who are investing in a bunch of other companies to make sure that they're they're playing in these spaces and and that they've they've got kind of uh, financial reasons and, and benefits, but then there's the ones that you can really see the the trust that's happening and and, and the brands really converging together. So um, you know you can see um, you know General Motors and Cruise you know working together. You can see Ford and Argo working together. You can see you know the emotional stuff we just we just heard about. Um, and and this is going outside of just uh, the AV space as in as in the the self driving car, but you know you get into the agriculture space as well, and you see. You know the the companies that John Deere is acquiring right now, and you start looking at you know all, the whole entire you know space is is, is happening that way. Um, you know at Imerit, you know we work with massive companies, uh, and we work with some smaller brands too. And, and what's interesting is these smaller brands come, and uh, all of a sudden they get you know five hundred million dollars in funding. You know six months later, and then all of a sudden they're part of some giant conglomerate six months after that. So you know I, I would say you know be be careful what you think is a small time player uh, because those small time players become massive players. You know in in a couple months. You know not not just years. And so you know you you have to kind of you know every every company that we work with you know we take seriously and we we dig down and and expect them to to be a, a major player. Um, I think, you know, like any really good innovative company knows that that change is upon you and that if you don't look at the what's happening in the space and, and how you're going to be displaced, then you're going to be displaced pretty quick. And so I, I think these large companies have been around for a long time for a reason. Um, and, and they're smart enough to realize that they need to work with these cutting edge technologies that are coming in and, and invest deeply um, and build that trust quickly that Gretchen talked about and become true partners, because if that doesn't happen, and it's just a financial thing, then then you, you can see the difference very quickly in the market. Great. Uh, so we're, we're almost out of time. I do want to take one question that we had from the audience um, about, uh, you know, a lot of money has been invested in AV technology. Uh, is it okay to tell investors that the AV outcome has been significantly scaled back and delayed? And uh, start with uh, start with you, Jeff. Since you're 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 right there, go go ahead. What do you think? Yeah, I, I mean, to, to me, it, it's not delayed. It's 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 running at the at the pace it, it needs to run for it to be safe. And and I think that uh, you know we're seeing the areas of this being deployed. Um, I think that uh, you know these applications are happening quickly, um, and so that that progress is happening. I, I, I go back to what is this. What does mass adoption actually mean? Um, I think you know is 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 the real question. And and when you go to Las Vegas and you hop in a self driving taxi that takes you to your hotel, and then you take it six more times before the end of the weekend, you're going to realize that these things are happening. You know, in in these different areas, you know, pretty quickly. Um, and then from a, again uh, from a B two B perspective, it's it's happening at a pretty big scale. We talked very little about the mining and and about the 
agriculture and, and these types of areas, but it's it's happening at scale in a lot of those spaces, and that's absolutely changing those industries. So uh, from an investment perspective, I think you can see um, where where it's you know impacting markets quick. I, I will go back to edge case, edge case, edge case for us to get to mass adoption of being able to move uh, freely. You know, yeah, there, there's a lot of work that needs to be done on the data side, and and people need to pick the right partner to work with on 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 those uh, on those you know unique challenges. And Dean? Oh, you're muted still. Thanks. Uh, so I kind of agree with Jeff. I mean, uh, safety is a priority right now. We're seeing this phased approach uh, and it's going as fast as it can kind of thing. And uh, as you see more and more adoption, more and more of these phased rollouts and more and more customer acceptance, you're gonna see that that curve going up much more faster as we as we grow over time. I mean, it's an extremely complex problem, as we all know, right? So as more and more people start using the tools that are available to help build out what they need, then, you know, that that uh, that curve is going to start uh, accelerating very much, very much more quickly. And uh, Gretchen, I'll give you the last word on this one. Uh, so I, I think, look, the, the sophisticated investors who understand the technology know that you have to nail those initial use cases and those initial deployments, and those will take time, and those will scale more slowly. But if you nail those, then that full TAM is available to you. And there's not that many entities that will be able to, to, to nail this, you know, really in a safety critical way. Um, and so, you know, a sophisticated investor, I think, knows that they're playing a long game if they're investing in this in this space. Uh, and that, you know, safety critical is is no joke. That takes time to get it right. This is not an, an MVP situation, like an, an an app you're pushing to a phone, you know, where it doesn't really matter if it's got a lot of bugs, you know, you've got to get it right. So I, I think the and sophisticated investor knows knows the potential that they're unlocking. I think that's a that's a great way to wrap it up. And uh, with, with that, I want to thank my panel, uh, Gretchen Efchen, VP of Go-To-Market for Motional, Dean Harris, Industry Business Development for Autonomous Vehicles and NVIDIA, and Jeff Mills, the Chief Revenue Officer at iMerit, 